So today we're going to look at systems that involve a mass on a spring. And the first thing you guys did was a little lab. And you asked, how does the distance that a spring stretches depend on the force that is applied on the spring? So hopefully you got a fairly straight line here. Um, and uh, you're going to find a math model. On the y-axis, you're going to have the distance it's stretched, which is delta x. On the x-axis, you're going to have the force. And you should have some kind of slope. And you should have gotten a relatively straight line there. So we would say that the distance that the spring is stretched is proportional to the force that is applied to it. And that idea is called Hooke's Law. And it turns out this is a really important idea. It's true not just for springs, but bungee cords, elastic bands. It's true for atomic connections. The uh, atoms are connected to each other um, with bonds that are modeled by springs. Um, and uh, so this is true for a whole bunch of physical phenomena. So this is called Hooke's Law, the idea that the distance is proportional to the force. So we say that the force that's required to stretch a spring from equilibrium is directly proportional to the distance the spring is stretched. And we're going to write that like this, slightly differently than we did it in lab. We're going to switch the two sides. But we're going to say the force is that the spring applies, this is the force that the spring applies, is equal to some constant, that was the slope, and that constant we're going to call the spring constant times the distance that the spring is stretched. Okay, so this is what we call Hooke's Law. So put this in your toolbox. Go ahead and pause the video and write that down. Here, F is the force that the spring applies. Delta X is the distance that the spring is stretched from its natural or normal length. And K is the strength of the spring. And then this little negative here, that just reminds us that it's in the opposite direction. If I pull a spring to the right, the force that the spring exerts is to the left. And if I push a spring to the left, it applies a force to the right. It opposes any displacements from equilibrium. So there is a point where the spring is happy, and any time you disturb that, if you pull it away from that, it tries to exert a force to get back to that point. Okay? So that is what we call Hooke's Law. And this idea we call linear restoring force. So when a spring or an elastic band or anything obeys Hooke's law, it produces what we call a linear restoring force. Now, a linear restoring force is just a fancy way to say that when something is moved, so imagine I have an object right here, and it's attached to a spring. If I pull it to the left, the spring tries to pull back to the right to get it back to there. And if I pull to the left, then the spring pushes to the right to try to get it back to there. The spring tries to keep whatever mass is hanging on it at a certain location called its equilibrium. And anytime you move it from that, the spring tries to get it back. So here's an example. I've got a spring and a mass hanging right here. And this is the equilibrium position. At this position, all the forces are balanced. Okay? The forces down, gravity, are balanced by the force of the spring pushing up. Now, if I were to pull this weight down, then the spring force would be bigger than the gravity force, and it will try to pull it back up. And if I lift this weight up, then gravity's force is bigger than the spring's force, and it'll pull the weight back down. And the farther I pull it from equilibrium, the greater the force on it trying to get it back to equilibrium. So that's what we call linear restoring force. In this case, the spring and gravity act together to try to keep the weight right here. And anytime you move it from there, it will try to get back there. So something interesting happens. If I pull this down right here and let it go, the spring is going to pull up on it, trying to get it back to equilibrium. And right there, it's at equilibrium, but because it's moving, it overshoots. And so the spring and gravity keep pulling on the spring, and when it gets to right there, for example, there's no more force on it. It's equal to equilibrium, but it's already moving downwards. So its inertia keeps it moving downwards, and it overshoots. And so this oscillates. It bops up and down. It becomes an oscillating system that exhibits periodic motion, and we're going to try to find the period of that motion. That's the idea today. So, when you have a linear restoring force coupled with a mass, and you disturb it, you get what is called simple harmonic motion. 
Okay, it's called simple harmonic motion. There's the link, by the way, that I was using. It's called simple harmonic motion because if you graph its motion as it goes up and down, it produces sine waves or cosine waves. And sines and cosines are called the harmonic functions. So harmonic motion is just the smooth motion of a mass on a spring as it moves up and down, and it could be left to right, that produces sine waves. Okay. If you want more of this, you'll have to come back for AP Physics because we study this more in depth and derive these equations. But we're just going to use the result that when you have a mass on a spring, you get harmonic motion. And the period of the motion, the time it takes to complete a cycle, is given by this formula. It looks very similar to the pendulum. The period equals 2 pi times the square root of the mass divided by the spring constant. And you'll notice in this case, the period does depend on the mass. Making the mass heavier makes the T bigger. It takes longer to complete a cycle. So go ahead and put this in your toolbox. T is the period, M is the mass, and K is the strength of the spring. It's usually measured in newtons per meter. Okay? Bigger, stronger springs have higher spring constants. Let me solve two examples with that. The first one is a bungee jumper. If a person has 50 kilograms of mass and they're attached to a bungee cord and the spring constant of the bungee cord is 65 newtons per meter. So that means that for this bungee cord, you've got to pull on it with 65 newtons of force to stretch it a meter. So this person here probably stretches it, I don't know, 9 or 10 meters. Anyway, if, uh, if they're just hanging there and everything's balanced, we say they're at equilibrium. But if you lift them up or pull them down, they will oscillate back and forth. It's basically a mass on a spring, and we want to know the period. So we find the mass and the spring constant from the problem. We're looking for the period, and it's a fairly simple problem. We're simply going to evaluate our expression, t equals 2 pi squared of m over k, to find the value of t, the period. So just plug in the numbers, plug it in your calculator, and you can see it takes about 5.5 seconds. I can only use two significant figures because I only have two here and two here. It takes about 5.5 seconds for this person to bop up and down to make a complete cycle. And then you do it again and again and again. Okay? If this person was heavier, then the mass would be bigger and their period would actually be bigger. They would take longer to bop up and down. Another one, slightly more complicated. This question says, what is the spring constant of a mass spring system? The mass is 1 kilograms and the period is 1.7 seconds. So you've got some kind of mass on a spring. You know the mass is one kilogram. You know the period is 1.7 seconds, and you're trying to find the spring constant. So in order to find the spring constant, you're going to have to solve this equation for k. So if you're still paying attention, here's a handy little trick. When you're trying to solve an equation, and what you're solving for is inside of a radical and in the denominator, one way you can solve it is just square the entire equation. If I square everything, I get t squared. 2 squared is 4. I get pi squared. And a squared of a square root makes the square root go away. So squaring this entire equation gets rid of the square root. Now, k is in the denominator. We cannot solve for things in denominators. So I'm going to multiply both sides by k here. And I'll get this. I'll get kt squared equals 4 pi squared m. Now, at this point, you can really solve for anything you need. If you need m, divide both sides by 4 pi squared. In our case, though, we're solving for k, so I'm going to divide both sides by t squared, and that'll leave k by itself. I can then plug in my numbers and get my result that the spring constant is about 13.7 newtons per meter. Okay? So you've got another set of problems that involve masses on springs that you're going to solve. And um, that'll be our introduction to masses on springs. Okay, so find the problem set and go ahead and get going on that.